first speaker, Payal Aurora. Uh, Payal is a professor and chair in technology values and global media cultures at the Erasmus University at Rotterdam. She's the author of The Next Billion Users, Digital Life Beyond the West, and her expertise are in the areas of internet usage in the global south, digital cultures, inequality, and data governance. So Payal, if I could ask you perhaps um, to start you off with a question, how would you say um, you've, re you've been doing your research on digital access for marginalized groups? What have been some of your key observations uh, from a feminist perspective? And keeping in mind also the current context of the pandemic. Clearly there's a high urgency to discuss these issues, particularly as you mentioned during this time, which basically amplifies and makes visible long-standing injustices and we've seen that it's not a surprise what's happening in terms of uh, disproportionately people of color or women are even more affected low-income people are even more affected and it's not that it's an even playing field and this is very typical of also the digital divide discourse right is if only we gain access to certain kinds of technologies we, that is the level playing field and then all of us can enjoy these benefits. And clearly, there are so many other markers, particularly if you're the intersectionality of gender and income and religion comes together in a very toxic mix, which amplifies the vulnerabilities. And at this point, it's a life or death situation, right? So the next point here I, I would like to stress on is there's a feminist data dilemma, right? On one hand, you want to uh, obfuscate, like very Hel Helen Nissenbaum's sort of push about, you know, women can take agency. So when you want to participate online, indeed there are studies of women become male, uh, so they can maybe participate on gaming platforms because, you know, it's going to take a long time, if ever, for these gender norms to change. It's a long-term process. In the meantime, if you are, say, a teenage girl in Saudi Arabia or you want access, you want to be part of the YouTube, you know, phenomena, you want to be part of all these things, you will take on, you will go on, um, you know, you'll take on a, uh, the masquerade of a male and participate in all these leisure activities online. Fair enough. I think that's uh, really justified. So these are strategic. But then there's also these um, imposed obfuscations, which are really important to understand because that skews feminist data because we don't quite understand how women are actually participating online. Firstly, it's deeply dissuasive because women often claim they're not online. In fact, some recent studies have been revealing that women over 30 to 35 say the internet's not for them because they're too old. Because remember, many of these populations who are low income tend to be grandmothers at that age. So that actually people don't quite get because that's actually supposed to be our peak, right? Functioning when we're in the West, we're talking about that's the peak of a woman's career, et cetera. And here women are grandparents at that stage. So they are, the internet is sold as something for young people, right? Yeah. So that is another, so the politics of uh, categories is really important because say, for example, you have astounding statistics of say, a majority of the first level of healthcare workers are women in India, for example, 900,000, or 40, something like 70% of farmers in Africa are actually women. And, you know, so the stats, I think there's another 30 million construction women, uh, construction workers are women. So you have, you know, you can just go down the list, and yet when you see the typical prototype photograph of a farmer or construction worker, it's usually male. And so this has also implications in the COVID, uh, you know, situation because of bailouts, like say supposing ass assistance, because farmers who are male and are doing commercial farming will get help, but women who are doing subsistence farming will not, because it's not counted as them contributing. And value of privacy of also for the sort of data dilemma, right, is that while there's been an absolute obsession about privacy, and I understand that, uh, you know, that is a very Western driven that's saying this is the most important value. When we have to understand privacy is a relative value to other uh, values that are very needed in a society. And sometimes you, when you add to the feminist angle, 
Fem privacy has long been perceived as that which is secluded. It's about domestication. It's about you veil yourself, you shut the doors on her, you protect her. And so in many ways, women have actually collectively pushed themselves and demanded visibility, understanding the high risks of giving up their privacy because they value the freedoms of pushing their voice forward, right? So how do we move forward is we really need to understand that the margins are the normative. I mean, we cannot, you know, emphasize that enough. And the moment we start to think through how do we cater to the marginalized majority, we would by default incorporate everybody versus the other way around of a trickle down sort of uh, policy and practice, right? And we need to shift our perspective from the user to the design angle because let's not take on this neoliberal sort of stance of let's put all of the burden on the shoulders of these women who are already overburdened, right? And let's look at the design of societies, of technical systems in ways that can genuinely empower them and push this conversation forward. Thank you.